presented, and one person who's been very much involved in these uh, discussions about what should policies to stimulate um, health needs driven research and development look like and how should you finance that um, is, is Charles Clift who for more than a, a decade and a half has been a central person in uh, an alphabet soup of committees and, um, and, and working groups starting with the UK Commission on Intellectual Property Rights, the uh, Commission on Intellectual Property Rights and Public Health and Innovation at the WHO. He has participated in the discussions on the Global Strategy and Plan of Action on Public Health, Innovation and Intellectual Property. You notice that the intellectual property is moving towards the end of the, of the alphabet, all to say that public health increasingly is becoming at the center of these discussions, and I'm going to ask him, and you can you can stay in your in your seat, so we don't lose any any time with walking away. There are microphones in front of you. Could you give us in the next five minutes a quick sort of historical overview of these policy processes and where you think we are now with the recommendations that Philippe also mentioned of the consultative expert working group, for example, to start. Uh, negotiations on a medical R&D treaty, and if possible, could you say a little bit about what is happening uh, today at the or this week at the WHO, where uh, demonstration projects in this framework are being discussed? Small order, five minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Ellen. Um, you said it's 15 years. Actually, it's about just over 10. I like to think, but uh, maybe it seems longer. Um, so I would, uh, you asked me to talk about uh, essentially the process in WHO, but I, I thought it would be useful to review, um, well, well, I like to think of it in two ways. One is progress in the, in the real world, which is where I think the NDI is and other PDPs. And the other is uh, progress in the world of international health diplomacy, which I call the unreal world for short. So uh, there, that is, I think, what you want me to talk about. And that's actually where I've spent more time in the unreal world than the real one. But um, I, I mean, I think in the, in the real world, in the last decade, um, you know, one, one thing has been we have seen more funding from governments for R&D. Uh, and in particular, we've seen uh, foundations, notably the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, up their spending from very little to um, half a billion a year or more on R&D for neglected diseases. Uh, the other thing is not just uh, more research, but um, a different kind of research. So uh, you've heard a lot of talk today about collaborative approaches and setting up networks and how this could be of benefit to everybody and um, the role that PDPs can play in uh, promoting innovation as the NDI has done and as other PDPs have done. Um, in the way we go about research as much as uh, the quantity of that research and that could be far more uh, important or transformative than simply increasing the amount of money in my opinion. And I think we've also seen a, a very big change in the way uh, industry approaches it. Um, 10 years ago, uh, you could read a lot of, uh, well, there, were, there, were, there was a, um, an advocacy campaign which started uh, in many ways with the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Working Group, which Yves Champé put up, the, the members of it this morning, and that was catalytic, I think, in sparking this debate uh, internationally. Um, it was catalytic, of course, in the founding of the NDI itself. And I think it was catalytic if you read the, uh, the fatal imbalance uh, document which was put out in 2000. 2001, uh, and set out a lot of the policy agenda that has then been pursued in various fora, including the WHO, including the idea that there might be uh, a treat or should be a treaty on R&D for neglected diseases, uh, and that um, we should de-link the, the cost of the funding of R&D from the price uh, of medicines. 
Um, and another of these uh, innovations is the MPP, which um, the Medicines Patent Pool, which uh, Philippe Dusbrazi referred to at length, um, of which I'm the chair of the board. Alan was the first executive director. Greg Perry, sitting there in the front, is currently the executive director. And uh, as Philippe said, this is, um, we think, uh, a very, uh, one of these new innovative approaches that could be uh, transformative in terms of delivering uh, both cheaper products and new products, including combinations. So um, I believe they're going to announce one new agreement in the near future with a, a company. And um, I'm empowered to tell you that they have also uh, now officially started negotiations with Abvi on pediatric HIV drugs. So that could also have a big effect in the medium term on the availability of new pediatric combinations for HIV. Um, so, and I, uh, to complete this um, review of uh, what is the real impact then in the real world, we have in our packs, which I don't, hadn't seen before, a new paper which um, sets out what progress has been in the last decade. And this is kind of um, a curate's egg, as we say in England, um, good in parts. There have been uh, some improvements. Um, there hasn't really been an improvement in the very small proportion of new chemical entities that are directed at tropical diseases or neglected diseases, which is still about 1% or so. On the other hand, there are in, um, more uh, products um, overall, about 4%, which are uh, for neglected diseases. And if you look at the pipeline of products currently between phases one to three, you can, uh, they predict that uh, then we'll have about, in the next six years or so, um, the annual number of products approved will more or less double. So that seems to be an indicator of a real change and um, of a, a real impact on health. Um, so that, that is my uh, brief analysis of, of what's happened in the real world. Um, now in WHO, which I've been um, involved in since, um, really since they decided to set up the Commission on Intellectual Property Rights, Innovation and Public Health in 2000. They decided to set it up in 2003 and it was set up in 2004 and it reported in 2006. And this, uh, as many of you will know, um, it made a lot of recommendations, but one there was there should be a global plan of action on neglected diseases, a strategy and plan of action. And then there were the long-winded negotiations uh, between governments in the Intergovernmental Working Group, which reduced, eventually resulted in uh, a global strategy and plan of action. This was followed by um, the expert working group on financing and coordination, which was one of the recommendations of the, of the um, plan of action was to set up a body to look at how uh, financing of R&D for these uh, diseases that mainly disproportionately affect developing countries could be enhanced. So we had one expert working group which reported in 2010. For various reasons, um, a number of member states, WHO, didn't consider that they had adequately fulfilled their mandate. Um, partly because they hadn't uh, discussed seriously the idea of uh, a treaty on R&D, and partly because they didn't seem to have taken very seriously the idea, uh, the, the uh, idea of delinking the costs of R&D from the price of the product. So that led to another expert working group called the Consultative Expert Working Group, CWG, and um, they finally, <laughs> I was involved in it, so um, I can say this. They finally came up with the goods, which was to recommend uh, a convention that, that, that member states of WHO should start preparations moving towards a convention on R&D. Uh, there was then a long discussion last year in the uh, World Health Assembly, a special three-day meeting at the end of last year 
which resulted in a resolution which said, well, okay, we'll discuss the question of a treaty um, in 2016, but in the meanwhile, we want to see some uh, demonstration projects which will illustrate the principles which were set out in the CWG, notably about um, delinkage, but also about pooling funding. Uh, and we, the, as many of you will know, there's currently a meeting in Geneva with, with a group of experts and, uh, and member states will be examining, I can't remember how many were submitted, but uh, a number of uh, projects that were submitted and these will then be approved by the WHO um, at, I think, the World Health Assembly, but it's not going to result in any funding for these projects. They'll just sort of, I suppose, have the imprimatur of WHO, and maybe that will help them to be funded. So that was for a very long process to result in sort of um, several unfunded demonstration projects. That's why, to me, it's not been a terribly satisfactory process to date. So one question is, how could one make it more satisfactory? What would one need to do? Thank, thank you, thank you, Charles. And um, here we also see the difference between the glasses half full and the glasses half empty. Because I would say, if I listen to you, wow, compared to where we were, Joanne, um, a, a decade or a decade and a half ago, where no one was talking about this, where no one was talking about R&D, let alone R&D for neglected diseases, there, is, there are a number of important policy, um, a policy initiative, policy debates that have shifted the landscape completely. Um, so that's what I hear him say. But that wasn't perhaps what he, <laughs> what he meant to say. We'll come back to that uh, in, in, in the discussion. It's also a very good illustration of what can be done in the real world, because the unreal world throws around ideas. And, and Philippe gave a number of good examples uh, of that, and the DNDI, of course, being a very clear one. 